Read Japanese Literature. My name is Allison Fincher. Read Japanese Literature is a podcast about Japanese fiction and some of its best works. All the works we discuss are available in translation, so you can read along if you want, and you can find out more at readjapaneseliterature.com. A brief content warning this episode includes mentions of suicide and an attempted rape in a novel. is probably Japan's most celebrated literary award. Before we turn to that award, though, I want to tell you a story. Stay with me, because this is going to get weird. Our hero wakes up one morning. He hasn't transformed into a giant cockroach, like the hero of Franz Kafka's famous novella, The Metamorphosis. But something is wrong. The first-person narrator tells us that there is an oddity, an emptiness in his chest. When he tries to pay for breakfast, he realizes he can't remember his name. Not only that, anything that should have his name on it has disappeared. All of his business cards, the label inside his suit, even the name on his ID card. He continues on to his office only to discover that he has been replaced by a doppelganger, by an identical copy. If he closes his left eye and looks at the doppelganger through just his right eye, our hero sees a copy of himself, but through his left eye alone, he sees a large paper card. In fact, it's his own business card that is successfully impersonating him, and no one else seems to notice. In understandable confusion, he goes to a hospital. There he picks up a magazine with a painting by Salvador Dali on the cover. It depicts a sand dune. The painting, quote, seems like a window that opened the bottom of the narrator's memory. The examination at the hospital doesn't work out. The narrator's tossed out the window into the nearby zoo, captured by strongmen, and then taken through a secret tunnel in the back of a polar bear's cage. He's then subjected to a bizarre trial that strongly resembles Alice facing the Queen of Hearts in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, More bizarre events ensue. It's only at the end of the novella that the hero's emptiness is filled when he turns into a wall, silently, endlessly growing. This is the gist of Kobo Abe's Akutagawa-winning novella, The Crime of S. Karma. Unfortunately, only the opening scene is readily available in English translation, thanks to the work of Juliet Winters Carpenter. The Crime of S. Karma is also an example of the Akutagawa Prize at its best. The committee identified an up-and-coming author of great merit who was poised for a long and successful career. The award helped position him for future success. To better understand the Akutagawa Prize and its place in Japanese literature, we'll start with an introduction to the history of literary fiction in Japan, We'll move on to the history of the Akutagawa Prize itself, from its creation in 1935 through its most recent winners, and then we'll look at the life and career of Kobo Abe, including his most famous book, The Woman in the Dunes. You might be happy to learn that no one in The Woman in the Dunes turns into an inanimate object. To set the stage for the Akutagawa Prize, I'm going to go all the way back to Edo, Japan. You might remember that Edo, Japan is the period of Japanese history from 1603 to 1868. We talked about high and low literature in Edo, Japan in season one of this podcast. Season one is a broad overview of the history of Japanese literature from about the year 700 to about 1990. At the time, I mentioned that we can divide Edo period literature and culture into two starkly different categories that were not supposed to overlap, high and low. In that episode, we spent most of our time on low culture. As a matter of fact, that's the only read Japanese literature episode so far that has required an explicit tag. But if we're going to talk about the Akutagawa Prize and the most highly regarded works of Japanese fiction, We'll need to talk about high literature. The contemporary word for high literature was ushin or ga. 
High literature was consumed almost exclusively in classical Chinese or classical Japanese. Its works were on refined topics deemed appropriate for the upper crust. Things like the classics from Japan or from China, real history, not historical fiction, and traditional poetry like waka, renga, or kanshi. In essence, if you're reading between the lines or listening between the lines, almost no fiction qualified as high culture at all. So the Meiji Revolution comes. It's the Meiji period. Around the turn of the 19th century, critics and editors started to use the word junbungaku, and that literally means pure literature for the best writing, for what 50 or 100 years earlier would have been called high literature. And when something was labeled junbungaku, most importantly, that means it wasn't impure literature. People didn't use the term impure literature. They used the term taishu bungaku for popular or mass literature. The literature the hoi polloi read, everybody else. That kind of distinction between pure and popular literature is easy to make, but difficult to actually explain. And it's the kind of distinction that most English language readers make today, too, even just implicitly, whether they admit it or not. Most people vaguely agree that something like Great Expectations by Charles Dickens is literature, and most people vaguely agree that something like Fifty Shades of Grey is not. I've never read Fifty Shades of Grey, by the way. I've just chosen to pick on this book. I apologize. But most people don't have a great answer if you ask them, why? And then you'll get a lot more disagreement if you start asking about books like Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 or Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. Meiji and Taisho-era Japanese critics and readers ran into the same sorts of trouble. During the Meiji and Taisho periods, publishing was all about newspapers and magazines. As a result, Many stories came out serially, one newspaper or magazine issue at a time over the course of weeks or months or even years. Both literary magazines and newspapers tended to fall on one side or the other of this major fault line between pure and popular literature. Eventually, the most celebrated of pure literature was supposed to appear in doujin zashi, or coterie journals. Coterie is more or less an English synonym for click, and coterie journals in Japan were endlessly clicky, just like their European and American counterparts. In Taisho, Japan, the click who ran the coterie journals was the bundan. That's written with the kanji, or Chinese characters, for literature, and then the kanji for stage or podium. Like pure literature, a definition for the bundan is hard to pin down. On the one hand, the bundan worked something like a union. For example, the organization successfully pressured publishers to pay decent rates. This is a reasonably good thing. But on the other hand, the bundan also became something of a gatekeeping institution for who qualified as the literary elite and who did not. And that master-apprentice system was often sorely abused. By the 1920s, author and cultural critic Kan Kikuchi was widely recognized as the most powerful figure in the bundan. He's responsible for one of the clearest definitions of pure literature. This is a clear definition, but not necessarily a useful one. This is what he had to say. Pure literature is that which the writer writes because he wants to. Popular literature is that which is written to please people. I should mention that Kikuchi started out his career as a pure literature writer. He then decided he wanted to actually make money and became more of a popular literature writer. And he was very transparent about this track. Kikuchi is especially important to us today because he went on to found the Akutagawa and Naoki Prizes. We'll come back to him. In the end, the definition of pure literature has ended up being kind of circular. It's pure if the Bundan says it's pure, and if the Bundan publishes it in their journals. And the Bundan is the Bundan because it produces pure literature and publishes it in their journals. 
This doesn't mean there's not some kind of existential difference between Great Expectations and Fifty Shades of Grey, just that a definition is elusive and that the Taisho-era term pure literature didn't get it exactly right. One more note about pure literature and the Bundan. The Bundan was a clique that left out marginalized people. Women are the most obvious example. When publishers set out to sell stories to women, they didn't categorize their writing by or for women as pure or popular literature. They started labeling these publications with a third label, Joryu Bungaku, or women's literature. We talked about this distinction a good bit in our episode about translating Japanese women. The offhand assumption is that the works of Joryu Bungaku were supposed to be linked because they're sentimental, impressionistic, not intellectual. These are traits of popular literature. And so by its very definition, women's writing was excluded from pure literature. I've told a story here about how women were largely excluded from pure literature, but they weren't alone. Lots of people were excluded, like Zainichi Koreans, ethnic Chinese, Okinawans, members of the Burakumen, a pre-Meiji outcast group, even ethnically Japanese people from the main islands who just lived outside of Tokyo. We'll look at their exclusion again when we turn to the Akutagawa Prize. The pure literature label was also out of reach to almost anyone who needed to make a living writing. Members of the Bundan were usually expected to be above such trivial concerns as paying for a roof over their own heads, or putting food on their own tables. As you might expect, what that really meant was that lots of members of the Bundan had families to pay for those things on their behalves. Starting after World War II, the distinction between high and low had started to blur. By the 1980s and 90s, the distinction had become pretty indistinct. A lot of Japan's most respected authors and critics were, and still are, unhappy about the new status quo. Yoriko Shono is a contemporary author who is still willing to fight for the label, Junbungaku. She won the Akutagawa Prize for her story, Time Slip Combinant, in 1994. Unfortunately, I don't believe that story or any of her writing is available in English translation. I would love to be corrected if you know where I can find one of her stories. In 2005, she released a book called Complete Resistance, A Forest of Writers, a true account of 14 years of the Junbungaku battle. According to Shono, the definition of Junbungaku, quote, is diverse and changes with time, so it is difficult to define at each moment. She argues that Junbungaku is more of a principle than a category of writing. And I think she may be on to something here. She says that Junbungaku writing is anti-commercial, anti-capitalist, anti-consumerist, and anti-globalist. Today, that may be the most useful observation about Junbungaku available. In January 1935, Kikuchi Khan's Korori magazine, Bungei Shunju, published the following announcement. Number one, the Akutagawa Prize shall be awarded to an individual for the best work produced by an unknown or rising author and appearing in any newspaper or magazine, literary Korori magazines included. Number two, the Akutagawa Prize shall consist of a prize, a watch, as well as a cash award of 500 yen. The first winner, Tatsuzo Ishikawa, later explained that his monthly cost of living at the time was about 40 yen, so 500 yen was essentially a year's worth of living expenses for a frugal bachelor. Number three, the members of the Akutagawa Prize Committee shall select the recipient of the Akutagawa Prize. The announcement went on to list who would serve on the committee. That first committee would include Kikuchi himself, and a number of well-known writers, including Yasunari Kawabata. I'm a bit overdue for an episode on Kawabata. He went on to become Japan's first Nobel laureate for literature. Four, the Akutagawa Prize shall be awarded every six months. Where there is no appropriate recipient, the award shall not be presented. And number five, the Akutagawa Prize recipient's work shall be published in the pages of Bungei Shunju. 
The announcement also established a sister award, the Naoki Prize. The Naoki Prize recognizes the best work of popular literature in any format by a new, rising, or reasonably young established author. The prize money and rewards are the same. I'd like to discuss the Naoki Prize in a later episode. Both the Akutagawa Prize and the Naoki Prize honor friends of Kikuchi who had recently died. Sanjugo Naoki died of a mosquito-borne illness, Japanese encephalitis, in 1934. Ryunosuke Akutagawa famously committed suicide in 1929. We've discussed that at length in a previous episode. Some people interpreted his suicide as a symbolic act. In the words of literary scholar Donald Keane, that act was an expression of profound anxiety over the state of the times or of a personal inability to resolve the conflicting attractions of Japanese traditions and a wave of the future. Now, Keane is describing here other people's views, not necessarily his own. Personally, I think Akutagawa had his own motivations, but that's outside of the scope of this episode. Regardless, Akutagawa was one of the most important literary figures of the Taisho era, Today, he is regarded as the father of the Japanese short story, and he's also one of the best-known Japanese authors outside of Japan. This is how Dr. Masumi Abe El Kure at the University of British Columbia described the selection process for the Akutagawa Prize in her 2011 thesis. The process hasn't changed much since the award was founded in 1935. 24 staff editors of the Bungei Shunju Limited Company sit on the 12 member selection committees for the Akutagawa and Naoki Prize. 12 members of the book publishing division and 12 members of the literary magazine division. The editors send out about 500 surveys to literary experts to ask for their recommendations of works written in the previous six months. The literary experts include the members of the Akutagawa selection committee. Today, the members are all highly regarded Japanese authors. Most of them are past winners of the Akutagawa Prize themselves. You might recognize some of the names, Yoko Ogawa, Kiichiro Hirano, and Hiromi Kawakami. Kawakami wrote People from My Neighborhood, and that collection includes Weightlessness, the story with which we opened our last episode. After the surveys come in, the editors read about 60 new stories on top of their regularly assigned work for the Bungei Shunju. The editors meet monthly to narrow down that list. They're not allowed to cut out any of the recommendations from the Akutagawa Selection Committee. And they are allowed to add suggestions of their own. Once they arrive at a short list, they send the stories to the Akutagawa Selection Committee members before their final meeting. When it comes to the Akutagawa Prize, the stakes are pretty high. Akutagawa winners are much more likely to make money for publishers than most Junbungaku stories. Most high literature is a losing prospect. Akutagawa winners are likely to get republished many times. Stories appear in magazines at least twice. The first appearance before winning and a second appearance after winning, this time in Bungei Shunju. They're then printed as tonkobon, or standalone books. The most popular titles get reprinted as bonkobon, an expensive, small format paperback. Going from serial novel or tonkobon to bonkobon is something like the equivalent of English language hardcovers being reissued as paperbacks. All Akutagawa winners appear in Akutagawa Sho Zensu, or the complete collection of Akutagawa prize-winning works. And if an author and publisher get really lucky, a work attracts an international audience and gets translated. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I'd make an educated guess that Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata might be the most commercially successful Akutagawa winner of all time. It has sold one and a half million copies in Japan. The English language translation by Jenny Topley Takamori became an LA Times bestseller and it has also been translated into more than 30 other languages. There are fascinating rumors about the kinds of mischief that some authors and their editors have gotten up to for that kind of profit and prestige. In 1972, for example, Akio Miyahara plagiarized part of Someone Touched. 
One industry insider claims it is an open secret that Ryu Murakami's editor heavily collaborated with him on his 1976 Akutagawa winning Almost Transparent Blue. According to this story, it took some work to make an already good novella more award-worthy. Let me just say, regardless, Ryu Murakami is a phenomenal writer, very much worth a read, Almost Transparent Blue has been translated, but it is almost impossible to get your hands on in English. Try instead In the Miso Soup, translated by Ralph McCarthy, or From the Fatherland with Love, translated by Ralph McCarthy, Charles DeWolf, and Jenny Tabli Takamori. If you want a really interesting satire on the process of producing an award-winning novel in Japan, Q1984 by Haruki Murakami really nails it. This kind of high-stakes enterprise is definitely going to have some losers. Osamu Dazai is maybe the most famous literary writer who failed to win an Akutagawa Prize. He was 26 in 1935, the year the Akutagawa premiered, so he was at just the right stage in his career to win. He published his first story under Osamu Dazai, which is his pen name, in 1933. That story, Reisha, or Train, was also his first experiment with that first-person, self-deprecatory, autobiographic style he's so famous for. Unfortunately for Dazai, 1935 was a generally unlucky year for him personally. He failed in a suicide attempt, which of course isn't unlucky, but then just two weeks later, he almost died from a ruptured appendix. While recovering, he became addicted to the opioid painkiller Pabinol, and that addiction shaped the next several years of his life. His desperation to win the prize was partially fueled because the prize money could help rescue him from debt. The Akutagawa committee saw the problems in Dazai's personal life. They even felt a great deal of pity. Remember, the committee members were men that he knew personally. He was part of the Boondan infrastructure. Nevertheless, it seems like the committee was reluctant to give the award to an author whose life was such a mess. Dazai was not happy about being passed over. He wrote a letter to Yasunari Kawabata. In the letter, he promised, I'll stab you, among other threats. I want to mention just two other Japanese authors who didn't win the Akutagawa. And these are two of the best known Japanese authors in English, Haruki Murakami and Banana Yoshimoto. It might not surprise you that these authors didn't win. They aren't always viewed as literary. I have to wonder though, How much of their reputation as not literary comes from being passed over by the Akutagawa Selection Committee? They were both nominated for the Akutagawa Prize. Murakami was nominated for Hear the Wind Sing in 1979 and Pinball in 1980. Yoshimoto was nominated for Transient in 1988's first award and Sanctuary for 1988's second. I don't believe either of those stories is available in English. Maybe it's worth noting that Kinzaburo Oe served on the Akutagawa Selection Committee from 1976 to 1995. He helped reject both. Oe had won the Akutagawa in 1958. He went on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1994. He also considers himself a Jumbungaku writer, whether or not he uses the label. Oe has been vocal about his opposition to Murakami and Yoshimoto and what he thinks their writing represents. In 1990, he was still serving on the committee, and he wrote this in a very famous essay. Quote, Serious literature and a literary readership have gone into a chronic decline, while a new tendency has emerged over the last several years, a largely economic one, reflected in the fact that the novels of certain young writers like Haruki Murakami and Banana Yoshimoto each sell several hundred thousand copies. I mentioned earlier that the Japanese literary powers that be have often excluded marginalized groups. That is certainly true of the Akutagawa Prize Committee as well. Sexism, at least, hasn't necessarily played out exactly how you might expect. For example, the very first Akutagawa committee in 1935 considered the work of several women. Today, the best remembered of these is almost certainly Fumiko Hayashi, 
Tsuneko Nakazoto became the ninth person and first woman to win the Akutagawa in just 1938. Overall, since the award's inception, there have been 180 Akutagawa winners. All of this is according to my count, but I've tried to be pretty careful. 126 men, including the one and only one person who declined the award, and 54 women, including one transgender woman. Chio Fujino won for The Promise of Summer in 1999. That means that the split between men and women has been about 70 versus 30 percent. There are other groups who are still radically underrepresented. Recall that the first woman to win an Akutagawa Prize did so in 1938. The first Okinawan writer didn't win an Akutagawa Prize until 1967. That was Tatsuhiro Oshiro for his story Cocktail Party. The first ethnically Korean writer, Ri Kaisei, won for his The Woman Who Fold Clothes in 1972. By the way, to fold clothes means to clean woven cloth. It's a step in the process of making clothes. In 1975, the first member of the outcast Buraku community, Kenji Nakagami, won for The Cape. Yang Yi was the first non-native Japanese speaker and the first ethnically Chinese person to win with his The Morning When Time Fades in 2008. Lee Kotomi was the first ever Taiwanese-born Akutagawa winner as recently as 2021 for her The Island Where the Spider Lilies Bloom. To the best of my knowledge, only the cape is available in English translation. I've heard rumors a translation of Lee Kotomi's The Island Where the Spider Lilies Bloom is in progress. The Akutagawa Prize was awarded twice a year, almost every year, through the end of 1944. The chaos of the end of World War II and the occupation required a four-year hiatus, but it has been awarded twice a year, almost every year, ever since, just like Kan Kikuchi intended. Today, the winners still receive a pocket watch. The monetary prize is now a million yen, about 7,800 U.S. dollars or 6,300 pounds or 7,200 euros as of January 2023. The latest Akutagawa Prize winners were announced just last week, January 19, 2023. 40-year-old Atsushi Sato won for his story Wasteland Family. The tale, set in Miyagi Prefecture, northeast of Tokyo, is about a gardener who loses all of his tools after the March 2011 triple disasters. He later loses his wife to illness. The other winner was 35-year-old Iko Itogawa for her story, Joy of This World. Kobo Abe's career was a rich and colorful one. He was not only a novelist, but also a film and stage director, playwright, essayist, and photographer. He was born in Tokyo in 1924. That makes him a little less than a year older than Yukio Mishima. By the way, Kobo is actually the Chinese pronunciation of the kanji that make up his Japanese name. In Japanese, his name is read Kimifusa. Abe's family wasn't from Tokyo. Both his parents were from the far northern Japanese island of Hokkaido, they were in Tokyo for the year for his father's medical research, but they were actually settled in the Japanese colony in Manchuria. Without trying to make any kind of political claim, I'll summarize by saying Manchuria is more or less in northeastern China. The central valley of Manchuria is a fertile plain, but Manchuria also has imposing mountains and arid deserts. The central plateau is made up of sand dunes reaching 500 feet, or about 150 meters. There are also dry stream beds and lakes of salt water. Japan seized the region and renamed it Manchukuo in 1931. I mention all this background on Manchuria because Manchuria and Abe's early life there are important features of his writing. Dunes and dryness and sand are frequent motifs. We already heard about dunes in The Crime of S. Karma. And as you can probably guess, The Woman in the Dunes features lots and lots of dunes. Because of Abe's status as a Japanese colonist, he always felt like an outsider. In a 1978 interview, he told the interviewer, I am essentially a man without a hometown. All things that are valued for their stability offend me. And here's a story Abe told about his childhood in Manchuria. 
During the Manchurian winters, it was sometimes too cold to go outside during recess. Abe made friends by telling his classmates stories by the 19th century American writer Edgar Allan Poe. Poe was actually fairly popular in translation among the Japanese. As you might know, Poe is famous for his ominous and macabre short stories. There's actually a Japanese writer, Taro Hirai, who took the pen name Edogawa Rampo. Edgar Allan Poe was instrumental to both the detective fiction and science fiction genres. Unfortunately for Abe, his supply of translated Edgar Allan Poe stories ran out well before the Manchurian winter ended. So Abe spent the rest of the winter making up his own Poe-esque short stories. That was the first time, he said, I began to write the kind of story that could entertain people. And you may recognize some of those fundamental elements of Poe in Abe's writing. Abe reluctantly returned to Japan and enrolled in Tokyo Imperial University to study medicine when he was 19. He wanted to honor his father through his studies, but he was also pretty practical. He later explained, my friends who chose the humanities were killed in the war. He would be exempted from military service, at least for the time being. Abe was not suited for medicine. He was a scientifically minded man, but he did not like the practical practice. Actually, he once joked that he was only allowed to graduate in 1948 on the condition that he wouldn't practice, and he never did. In 1945, Kobo Abe married Machi Yamada. Yamada went on to become a stage director and an artist successful in her own right, and the two often worked together. They began their careers as members of the same artistic leftist circles in Tokyo in the 1950s. Machi did the set design and costuming for many of Kobo's plays. She even illustrated several of Kobo Abe's novels, including The Woman in the Dunes. The English translation linked on the episode page features her illustrations. Machi only survived Kobo by a few months. She seems to have burned his personal diaries before she died. I should mention also that Abe carried on a long-standing affair with a former student and later professional actress named Karen Yamaguchi. She published a memoir about that in 2013 called Kobo Abe and Me. That is not available in English translation. I've linked to a very thorough review on the episode page. 1945, the year Abe married, was a difficult time for people living in Tokyo. Between deaths and evacuations, the population of Tokyo had fallen by half during the course of the war. Abe sold pickles to support his family. Abe self-published a book of poetry, Poems of an Unknown Poet, in 1947. The next year, he published his first novel, The Road Sign at the End of the Street. It was well-received in Japan, but it remains untranslated into English. As we've mentioned, Abe won the Akutagawa Prize in 1951 for the crime of S. Karma. That's the story we discussed at the beginning of the episode. Abe's success truly began with the publication of The Woman in the Dunes in 1962. The Woman in the Dunes was translated into English by Dale Saunders in 1964. It was very unusual at the time for a Japanese book by a mostly unknown author to be translated into English so quickly. As a matter of fact, it's not that common today. The Woman in the Dunes was also made into a highly regarded Japanese art house film. It was directed by Jiroshi Teshigahara. Abe adapted the screenplay for that movie. As I've mentioned, Abe's career was rich and colorful. He was one of the most vocal champions of Japan's budding science fiction genre. He owned and ran his own drama studio. He was a photographer and even an amateur entomologist. For many years, Abe was one of the world's best-known Japanese literati. That meant he was also widely translated, again, unusual for a Japanese writer in the 70s and 80s. In a 1979 New York Times article, he was described as the top-selling Japanese author in both the United States and the Soviet Union. Kobo Abe died of acute heart failure in a Tokyo hospital in January 1993. It's widely speculated that he was the most likely candidate for the 1994 Nobel Prize for Literature. The laureate that year instead was Kenzaburo Oe. 
The woman in the dunes opens with an indifferent statement from an omniscient narrator. One day in August, a man disappeared. He was an amateur entomologist, someone who studies insects. The man has been gone for seven years and no body has ever been found. The narrative itself doesn't open until chapter two. That amateur entomologist is our hero, and we meet him the morning he will disappear. He arrives at an unnamed seaside village. He's come there hoping to find a new species of insect, and maybe that's more likely in an area covered by sand. About a third of the way through the book, we learn that this entomologist's name is Niki Junpei, but the book almost never refers to him by name. It's like his identity isn't all that important. I wondered how much of himself Abe wrote into Junpei's character. Abe was also interested in insects. Abe, too, was obsessed with sand. He once related a story about a banker who was so preoccupied with sand that he quit his job to study sand and then write a book about it. His wife interrupted to add that only one person actually bought the banker's book, and that person was Kobo Abe. We even find out at the very end of the book that Junpei and Abe share a birthday, March 7th, 1924. When the entomologist's first day in the village is over, he plans to board a bus back to his hotel. One of the villagers stops him. The last bus is already gone. He leads the protagonist back through the village, and every building has a sign on the front, Love Your Home. Eventually, the two men arrive at a massive hole in the sand. The protagonist climbs down a ladder to a house where he thinks he's going to spend the night. A bizarre accommodation, but what the heck. He meets the homeowner, a 30-year-old widow, and bizarrely, she spends all night keeping her broken-down, weather-beaten house from being buried by the sand. She explains it's part of her commitment to the village. After all, if her house is buried, her neighbors are at risk. Love your home is the village's motto, but it's also a shared commitment that the residents will spend their lives keeping their village from disappearing. In a day or two, Junpei realizes he's been tricked. Whether he likes it or not, he's now a part of the village too, and he's going to have to help the woman keep her house from being buried. Junpei tries very hard not to incur any debt to this woman he's suddenly living with. If he incurs a debt, he thinks he really will become a part of the village, and that's the last thing he wants. It's really a useless hope. He relies on this woman to teach him how to live in a hole in the sand, and the villagers bring them water and food every day. The man and the woman begin a sexual relationship. Sometimes it seems mutually gratifying. Sometimes Junpei is really aggressive. At least once he attempts to rape her. Late in the novel, she becomes pregnant. The protagonist spends the rest of the book trying to escape. In between, he philosophizes. For example, Junpei realizes how desperately anyone might try to cling to stability after living through World War II in Japan. The woman he lives with is content to be trapped. She explains, they used to make me walk a lot until I came here. And Junpei understands why the people of the village lose all will to escape. This is what he explains. There are kitchens, there are stoves with fires burning in them, there are apple crates in the place of desks piled with books, there are kitchens, there are sunken hearths, there are lamps, there are stoves with fires burning in them, there are torn shoji, there are sooty ceilings, there are kitchens, there are clocks, there are running clocks, and there aren't. There are blaring radios, there are kitchens and stoves with fires in them. It goes on, terrifyingly repetitive. One cannot do without repetition in life, like the beating of the heart. At the end of the novel, the protagonist realizes that protecting the house from the sand isn't really that much more futile than anything else he might do with his life. He tells the woman, what's hardest for me is not knowing what living like this will ever come to, but obviously you can never know no matter what sort of life you live. Heads up, I'm going to spoil the ending here. If that bothers you, you probably want to skip ahead 30 seconds or so. In the end, the woman's pregnancy turns out to be ectopic. That means the fetus is outside of her uterus and cannot survive. Her life is also in danger. When the villagers come to take her to the hospital, they accidentally leave a rope ladder behind. The protagonist finally has his chance to escape. But now he has incurred that debt. He has obligations. 
the woman who would have been the mother of his child is having a life or death medical crisis. And when he climbs the ladder, the air outside, quote, only irritates his throat and does not taste as he has expected. Maybe there is, quote, no particular need to hurry about escaping after all. And he climbs back down the ladder. So why read Akutagawa winning stories? Remember that not all of the Akutagawa winners are available in English. But what has been translated represents some of the best and most original writing available from Japan in the last 90 years. Older Akutagawa winners include some of Japan's most important modern writers, not just Kobo Abe, but also Shusaku Endo, Hiromi Kawakami, Taeko Kono, Kenzaburo Oe, and Yoko Tawada. Newer winners are some of the most important Japanese writers today, Writers like Mieko Kawakami, Sayaka Murata, Fuminori Nakamura, and Hiroko Oyamada. You can find a list of Akutagawa prize winners available in English on the episode page. And why read Kobo Abe? Well, he was a magnificent writer. His prose is evocative and elusive. His aren't novels you take to the beach, no matter how much he writes about sand, but they do provide plenty to think about when you read. His work is also some of the most widely read in English translation. If you want to be a part of the broader community of people who read Japanese fiction and translation, Kobo Abe's work is a must. I've been reading from The Woman in the Dunes, translated by Dale Saunders. Buy your books through our link to bookshop.org to support the podcast. Several listeners a month are already supporting us that way. We really appreciate it. You're helping us offset the cost of running the podcast. You can also support the podcast in other ways. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice. You can become a supporter through Patreon for as little as $3 a month. For $5 a month, you'll get a mention at the end of an episode. For $10 a month, you can get a lovely Read Japanese Literature laptop sticker. And for $25 a month, we'll send you a personalized Japanese book recommendation every month. Thank you to our new subscribers, including Yoshe. Find out more at patreon.com slash read Japanese literature. We'd love to hear from you about the podcast. There are many ways to stay in touch through our website, readjapaneseliterature.com. We're on YouTube. We're on Twitter, Instagram. Thank you to Professor Musume Abe Okore. Her master's thesis was an invaluable resource. Thank you to Professor Alyssa Friedman. I was privileged to take a course with her. I'm indebted to her lecture on Kobo Abe. Thank you to Sharon Dohmeyer at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for her continued and invaluable help with sources. Thank you to the Japanese Literature Group on Goodreads and Facebook. Thank you to producer Kime for today's music at Kime Music and KimeMusic.com.